We're in Mark 16. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. Now, as you're turning there, you'll notice that I'm mentioning 1 through 8, and there's brackets around verses 9 through 20. I'm going to get to that in a minute, okay? So just sit tight on that issue. That's an issue I need to address shortly, and I want to explain a few things about why those brackets are there. That really shouldn't concern you too much today, because I want to focus on verses 1 through 8, which are the core sort of account here in this passage. So only eight verses as we wrap up our time together. So let's read starting in verse 1 of chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. All right, let me pray and bless, ask God to bless our passage today. Lord, we're amazed, not just that you died for us, but we're amazed that you rose for us. Um, and how shocking that must have been to the earliest followers of Jesus. And certainly to this, in this account, the women, and how shocked and amazed they were. And Lord, we rejoice today in this, but remind us from our passage why we believe this, why we can trust it, why we can have confidence that it happened as the foundation for everything we believe. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So some of you may know that uh, years ago we had an opportunity to do our sabbatical in Cambridge. So back in 2009, I had a research sabbatical, which we get from time to time here as professors at RTS. And so I swept up the family and off to Cambridge, England we went, where I was a visiting press professor there at the university. And we lived there for six months. And, uh, you know, Cambridge is just an amazing place with all kinds of rich history, of course. And we lived in this beautiful little cottage right there by the, by the place we were studying in Tyndall House and just had a great time. The kids were really young. They were nine, six, and three by the time we left. So they were quite young, and, and uh, we had them over there. But when you're over there, you sort of get this sense that let's do something that maybe we haven't done before. So in the evenings, uh, and of course in the evenings in, in the UK, it gets dark pretty fast, especially if you're there over the fall. I said, okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to read to these kids every night. And so one of my favorite books, as you know, is, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, which, of course, if you're in England, read, reading Tolkien is great, right? So I was like, these kids have never read Tolkien before. So they you know, saw some cartoons or something. So I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from the beginning. We're going to read through this, and we're, each night I'm going to read, and they're going to listen, and it's going to go great. Well, of course, you know how that went. <laughs> but eventually they caught up, and they caught on, and they were listening intently. And, and certainly Emma, who was the oldest kind of got it the most. John was there 50% of the time. Kate was in the other room doing something, but she was there. And so we were reading these. And as the, the story unfolds, you get to love the characters, right? You, of course, you've got Frodo there with the ring and you've got Samwise and Marion Pippin and everything. But one of the most beloved characters, of course, is Gandalf, who's the kind of the, 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 the group leader as they're going to take the ring to Mordor to get it destroyed. People forget that very early in the books, there's three of them, right? Fellowship of the Ring, they have this tragic scene in the Mines of Moria where Gandalf dies. And he falls into this crevasse, this big sort of canyon, fighting this monster and perishes. And what's, what's interesting about it is I've read the story many, many times. And so I, I knew it was coming, but I didn't really do the math and think about what, what would my kids think about it coming. And I can remember, and Emma was the one most engaged, she was just utterly devastated by this. I mean, just, you, Gandalf can't die. Gandalf's the guy who's going to lead them out of this. Gandalf's their, their, their champion, their hero, their savior. He's the guy who's in charge. And then he dies? What? And you, you could get the, the, the sort of tears and the, and, the, and the pain and the perplexing nature of it fresh right there. I'm watching my nine-year-old daughter. Um, and, and I'd miss that because it's been a long time since I read the stories new. 
And now I knew the ending. Or rather, she didn't know the ending. I knew the ending, so she got it in a way that we just really couldn't get it. Well, now fast forward to the second book, The Two Towers, where, if you've read the books, Gandalf comes literally back from the dead um, and has a resurrection experience where he's then not Gandalf the Grey, but Gandalf the White. And then to see her eyes light up, you could see it build it up. She's like, there's this mysterious... And then she's, it's, it's Gandalf, how can he be... You know, he's alive, you know, in this sense, and it just... You realize that when you say, be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, I'm like, that's what I want to be, right? I want to be like my daughter. I want to be, I want to feel the pain of the loss, and I want to feel the joy of the recovery. In our story today, of course, that's exactly what's going on. When we pick up the story, and I said a little bit of this last week, we pick up the story, they're still deep in the loss, okay? Effectively, their hero has died. And, 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 and we'll see in a moment that they don't think there's silver lining here. Okay, there's, 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 it's, it's over in their world. And then we're going to see the joy and the, and, the, and the excitement on the resurrection. Now, take a look at your outline. Here's the way we're going to do this today. I'm going to give you, for our final study, alliteration, three Ps to take home with you today. We're going to look at pessimism about the resurrection in verses 1 through 3, and I'm going to walk through what these women are doing and what it means and why it's so significant to set the stage for the understanding that no one was expecting the resurrection. That's going to be really important for its evidence. And then Roman numeral two, the proof of the resurrection. There's three things in our story and three things throughout the New Testament that we point to as reasons to believe. Now, as I already indicated, if you wanted a really significant academic tome on this, you could read N.T. Wright's book, and then, of course, other books, too, about this. But we're going to do the basic three things that we look to as proof of the resurrection. Then you look at the last point, proclamation of the resurrection. There's my third P. You go and tell. This is exactly what the disciples were called to do. This is what the women were called to do, and this is what we're called to do. Um, The final, or the second to last verse in our passage, the, the angel says, go and tell. What a great ending. That's gonna be the takeaway today, right? is to realize why we believe this and realize that we don't just believe it, but then we respond to it, and we respond to it by doing something. We go, and by go, it's, notice the echo here of the Great Commission, right? You go out implicitly, immediately to the people around you, but then eventually to the world, and you tell them that Jesus is alive. He is the Lord of life and the giver of life. Okay, so that's where we're going to be going today in our three Ps. However, before we get there, You'll notice in your notes a short excursus here. I need to pause and just explain what's going on with these bracketed verses. Whenever you get to the end of Mark, it's time to understand what's going on in these bracketed verses. If you have a, probably a, any of your major English translations will say what mine says. I'm looking at just the ESV here. When you get down before verse 9, there's a little bracket. It says, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. Now, I've taught the Gospels enough and talk about this enough to know that this, this is one of those little brackets you read and you're like, why does my heart flutter here? Why does that make me nervous? Right? What does that mean? Does that mean I can't trust my Bibles? Well, I'm, I don't have time to give you my full lecture on this, right? You want to extend in my Gospels class, you can get the full story. Um, but I'm going to give you the brief version here. Keep in mind that, that we have very good evidence for the transmission of our New Testament text. Okay, So much evidence that we can work our way back to what the original authors wrote with a really high degree of confidence. This is, in fact, what I spend most of my time doing, looking at early Christian manuscripts, studying early Christian scribal culture, talking about how we transmit the story of Jesus over time. We have, when it comes to the Gospels, thousands and thousands of copies. That is really good news, because when we have that many copies from scribes, we can see the way those stories have been transmitted over time, and we can have confidence that they've been transmitted reliably. Occasionally, though, there are what we call scribal variations, okay? Now, when you hear scribal variations, don't panic. Anytime in the ancient world when a book is copied, you're going to have scribal variations because in the ancient world, when you copied a book, you copied it by hand. A scribe sat down with a pen or quill, dipped it in the ink. He had his thing he's copying, he had a blank piece of papyrus, and he had to copy word by word, even letter by letter, until you had the, the thing copied. You don't take it down to, the, to Kinko's and run off a copy, right? It's not like it is in our modern day. Boy, wouldn't that be nice. By the way, the scribe's job in the ancient world was brutal. I mean, th- th- we actually have manuscripts where scribes at the end make little marginal comments. I'm tired. 
Uh, you know, my back hurts. I mean, kid you not, right? I mean, they're like, this is a tough job. Um, occasionally what happens is scribes make mistakes, okay? But, but the New Testament documents, that, that's par of, every, every document in the ancient world is copied like that. Every document in the ancient world has scribal variations from time to time, um, and that's very normal. Um, and like I said, because we have so many copies, we can work our way back to the original. Every now and then, though, you have what we might call an insertion into the text, okay? This only happens twice in our entire New Testament, so don't think it's significant, but this is one of those times. Scholars believe, and I think they're right, I'm one of those scholars, that verses 9 and following was what we might call a later edition, okay? When we say later edition, what means the scribe inserted this probably sometime in the second century into the copies of the Gospel of Mark. By the way, that doesn't mean that what's in 9 through 20 is all lies. Sometimes scribes inserted things that were true, just that they weren't originally there, okay? What's our job? Our job is to work back to what was originally there. Uh, And so we're going to stop our discussion at verse 8 because we think 9 through 20 is probably exactly what I just said. It's probably one of those later scribal editions. People ask me all the time, well, if it's a later scribal edition, why is it in our New Testament? Why don't I I have an English Bible where it stops at verse 8? Why do I even have it here at all? Well, there's a whole reason. The history of the English Bible is the reason for that and the influence of the King James, okay? And people are so used to seeing it that if you took it out, you probably wouldn't sell many Bibles. So there's that. Uh, And then there's a minority report among scholars. Some think it was original, and that's a larger discussion. Now, all of this I know is like, well, I didn't want to spend our last day talking about this in Bible study, but I have to because it's right there, right? You see the brackets. What I want to reassure you on is that actually we have a very reliable text. And I also want to remind you this. Even though we don't have 9 through 20 as part of Mark, Mark does not lack the resurrection. There's no body. Jesus is resurrected. The angel says he is risen. Okay, so there is a resurrection here, and we have the other three Gospels that give us even more details than Mark. So there's nothing lost here at the end of the day. Now, I know some of you have more questions, and my job today is not to burn all our time on those. So here's what we've done. I wrote an article a few years ago for Table Talk on this. You can see it there on your table. Table Talk is a, like a little journal, really magazine, uh, with Ligonier Ministries. And you can see the title of this, Can We Trust the New Testament by Yours Truly? And I deal exactly with this issue in this article, okay? Um, And so when you go home today, if this is sort of sticking in your brain, you really want to have more information and find out kind of, well, what does he mean when he talks about scribal transmission, blah, 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 read this article, and I think hopefully this will answer your questions without us having to burn the entire hour on it. Um, But like I said, you can have great reassurance that the transmission of our New New Testament text is very reliable. Now, Here's the thing, and I've, done, I've, done, I've taught seminary long enough to know this. As soon as I hand you a document, what's going to happen now? You're going to want to read the document, right? So let me tell you, don't read the document. Because if you read the document, I won't, I won't get you for the rest of the study, okay? So take this little document, put it in your Bible, read it later when you're done, and you can have your questions answered, I hope, about that particular issue. So don't get sucked into it yet, or you'll miss where we're going from here. Okay, there's our excursus. Like I said, more can be said. I hope the article can answer some of those things. Okay, back to the text. Let's talk about our three Ps. And we're going to begin with the first one there, pessimism about the resurrection, which is in the first three verses. Okay, let's pick up then in 16.1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Okay, remember what's going on here. Jesus died on a Friday, right before the Jewish Sabbath, which was on a Saturday. So they take Jesus' body off the cross late on Friday before sundown. Remember, the Sabbath starts on a sundown. And they're in a hurry to get him buried before the Sabbath, because in Jewish culture, you don't leave a dead body up through the Sabbath day. So they bury Jesus hurriedly, in our last account, in this sort of tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But the women know he hasn't been properly prepared for burial, at least according to Jewish custom. So they wait through the Sabbath day. Jesus is in the tomb all day Saturday. Sunday morning, the day after the Sabbath, now they begin to do what they had intended to do, which is, as you can see in the text, they went and bought spices so they might go and anoint him. Okay, this is classic Jewish practice for a dead body. This is what you normally do. The women are off to do it. It's somber work. It's mournful work, 
By now, the body is starting to just get to the point where it's starting to begin the decomposition process two days in. And so they want to get the anointing on there to preserve the body according to a typical burial customs. Notice the rest of this is very standard, too. Um, they, ver, verse 2, and very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Remember, they knew where it was. And verse 3, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance? Okay, so because of the sort of hurried nature of the whole thing, they, they say, well, we're going to charge off first thing in the morning with our spices to anoint the body. They, don't, they haven't done the math on everything yet, right? They, didn't, they don't know who's going to roll away the, the stone. They figured they'll figure that out when they get there. But remember when I talked about ancient burial customs, this is standard. Tombs in the ancient Jewish world were not underground. They were above ground, and you would bury them in a chamber, usually a stone chamber, and then roll some stone in front of it, mainly to keep out animals and to keep out thieves, okay? Tomb robbery in the ancient world was a big problem, okay? We usually think of you know, grave robbers as taking treasure, sort of like in the tombs of Egypt, and that happened a lot too, right? Whenever we find a tomb in the sort of uh, deserts of Egypt with the ancient pharaohs, finding an unrobbed tomb is incredibly difficult to do, which is why King Tut's tomb years ago, when you heard about it, they found that tomb. What made it so amazing is it hadn't yet been pillaged. Okay, so tomb robbery was a big deal. So the stone is typical. All of this matches what we know historically. This is important for you to realize. The type of description we have here of the burial of Jesus, is it fits with the evidence we have about the way burial in the ancient world worked. This is not someone just making stuff up. This is not someone who's like coming up with sort of things out of thin air. This fits exactly with what we know um, uh, about the ancient world. Now, why does all this matter in verses 1 through 3? What I want you to pick up on these verses is something I hinted at in the opening, is it reminds us here of the hopelessness of the followers of Jesus. If you think Jesus is going to rise from the dead, you don't anoint his body. Let me just say that again. If you're thinking Jesus is about to rise from the dead, you're not marching to the tomb on Sunday morning to anoint the body. You anoint a body that's going to decompose. In other words, you only anoint bodies that you believe are going to stay dead. Now, does this mean that women lacked faith and were unbelievers? No. What this means is all of the followers of Jesus at this point had reached a point where Jesus was dead in such a way that they thought that this was the end of it that a dead Messiah is no Messiah. A dead Savior is no Savior. In other words, to put it bluntly, they lost. And they felt it. And they were demoralized. And they were in despair. You'll notice that at this point in the game, and we don't have the scene here, but the other Gospels tell us that the disciples are, of course, cowering in the upper room waiting for the dust to settle on this whole Jesus thing. Why? so they can sort of slink away with their lives and recover whatever's left of them and not get arrested and killed themselves. So they're just kind of waiting for the storm to pass. The women are brave enough at least to go to the tomb, okay? But but regardless, all of them are at a point where they're like, it's over. We lost. We thought he was going to be the true savior of the world. Apparently, he was not. Now, you may not know this, but in the ancient world, there had been before Jesus other would-be messiahs. Did you know this? So obviously Jesus was the true Messiah, but other people had proclaimed to be the Messiah before Jesus ever came, or at least the Jews thought that they had found someone who might be the Messiah. This actually helps set the stage here really in a really important way you may not know. I've, I've repeatedly in this class said I want to give you a little bit of the history of the Roman world at this time, and remember I've said repeatedly that the Jewish nation was under the thumb of Rome and wanting to sort of break the bonds and be free again. Well, prior to Jesus, some of these would-be messiahs were military leaders who the people rallied around as potential deliverance, uh, deliverers for the nation of Israel, who would basically fight against the Jews, or sorry, fight against the Romans, set the Jews free, and that would be our Messiah. He's a son of David. David was a warrior. We expect our Messiah to be a warrior, and they were looking for these messiahs. N.T. Wright, in the book I just mentioned, actually goes through these other would-be messiahs before Jesus. Here's what's interesting, is it Every one of those messianic movements ended in all the same way. Each of them ended because the Romans captured the would-be Messiah and put him to death. And each time that would-be Messiah was put to death, guess what happened to the movement? It ended. And people said, well, we gave it a go. We thought Judas Maccabees was our Messiah. Apparently not. The Romans put him to death. On to the next one. 
In other words, you have to realize, in the water of first century Israel, is not the sense that when your Messiah dies, we're just looking at our watch, well, he'll raise from the dead any moment. When your Messiah dies, that's it. It's all over. When you see the women going to the tomb, they are doing what you would do in the ancient world. You are ex- you're not expecting someone to rise from the dead. Okay, now why does this matter so much? We have to realize in this situation, something caused the early Christian movement to shift. In total despair and loss, without hope, suddenly, like that, they say Jesus is alive, and the whole movement does a pivot in a 180. How can we explain that historically? By the way, when we say how, we can, how can we explain that historically, it is an historical fact that the Christian movement came to believe Jesus rose from the dead and did a 180 pivot. That's not even the dispute. Someone may dispute the historical fact of the resurrection. Okay, they may dispute that, but what they cannot dispute is that Christians believed he rose from the dead and the entire movement lived on. That requires historical explanation. Let me put it another way. If every other prior Messianic movement ended because the Messiah was killed, why didn't this movement end? Now, you could argue, oh, because these group of followers were just expecting Jesus to rise from the dead, and they see a shadow behind a tree, oh, there's Jesus. They see a shadow over here, oh, that must be Jesus. And they're just ready and willing at any moment to find Jesus everywhere. Like, you you, you miss Elvis, and you think Elvis is alive, and you see Elvis, you know, at the shopping mall, or whatever happens to be. That's the way these Christians were. They were gullible. They believed it. Really? That's not what the evidence is showing. There's no evidence here that they were waiting for the resurrection or expecting it to happen or were were predisposed to find Jesus around every corner. In fact, the opposite is true. Even when they start seeing Jesus, what do the disciples say? Ah, nope. What happens when Mary sees Jesus in in John's gospel face to face? Doesn't recognize him. This idea that the disciples are all ready to, to, to pick up on any shred of evidence given to them and hold on to it. No. This is a group that's going to take overwhelming evidence to change their direction. Now, Here's the point. If it took overwhelming evidence to change the direction, and the direction was changed, which it was, what could explain that historically? I suggest to you, and this is what Christian scholars have suggested, that it would take a monumental, enormous, huge, miraculous event to turn this around. Gee, maybe it would actually take the resurrection itself to turn this around. And that's exactly what we want you to see, is that this is not a group gullibly ready to believe anything. This is a group that does what every Jewish group would do, which would just simply give up, and they had. they completely given up. Something has to turn it around outside themselves. Kind of had this vision in, of the disciples in the upper room, all despondent. You, can you imagine one of the disciples, maybe Peter would do this, where he would say, guys, this, let's not be so down about this. We can save this. We don't need Jesus. Yeah, it didn't work out. He's dead. But look, you know, we're, we, we're good teachers. Let's, 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 let's put this movement together and we'll, we'll, we'll keep it going. Look on the bright side. No, no, no. That's not what's happening. No one was doing that. Okay? Everybody was looking to save their own skin at this point. All right, so what's, what's the first P? Feel the pessimism because it's real. And it's actually the pessimism that's part of the proof. Okay? Now, let's move on to the proof. Second of your P's there, verses four through six. When the women get there, three things happen. We have an empty tomb, we have angelic testimony, and we have eyewitnesses. Now, Mark doesn't give us the full story of Jesus's later appearances. Okay, the other gospels do that, but he tells us that they'll see Jesus. So he hints at this resurrection appearance. So here's the three reasons why we believe the resurrection is true historically. And I want you to set the see this in Mark. Because of the empty tomb, because of the angelic testimony, because of the eyewitness uh, uh, appearances of Jesus. And I could add a fourth one to that, which I've already added, which is the ongoing existence of the early Christian movement. The fact that Christianity survived at all is evidence for the resurrection. Regardless, let's jump into these proofs in this text. Let's start first with the empty tomb, and here we pick it up in verse 4. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, we'll get to this young man in a moment, sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, they were alarmed. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. Look at this line. He is not here. In other words, they go to anoint a body, 
and there's no body. I just want you to let this sink in for a moment because this is one of the fundamental evidences for the resurrection is, is simply that the tomb was empty. They went down to a body, the body isn't there. Now, the other Gospels tell us, Mark, remember Mark doesn't give us every detail, the other Gospels tell us there's something that was there though, there was linens, there was grave clothes. The, we don't get that particular detail in Mark's section here, but that tells us that, hey, it's weird. You, you might expect to find the body without the grave clothes, but you're not going to expect to find the grave clothes without the body. Something's off here, right? Bodies don't just get up and leave <laughs> when they're dead. So what's going on? Now, I'm going to come back to a passage in a minute. We're not turning there right now, 1 Corinthians 15, which gives us some of the earliest evidence we have for the resurrection. But here in Mark's gospel, the empty tomb is central and foremost to our belief in the resurrection. He is not here. Now, you can imagine that skeptics have tried to explain the empty tomb in other ways besides the resurrection, right? And in principle, it's possible to have an empty tomb besides the, the person coming back to life and rising from the dead. Sure, that's true. So I'm going to tell you about two very popular attempts to explain this empty tomb. Look down in your notes. One idea is that the disciples stole the body and made up the resurrection. That's a very common uh, and histor long historical argument. And then a second argument is that Jesus wasn't really dead. He just swooned on the cross and then kind of re was refreshed in the coolness of the tomb with the spices and kind of came back to life. That's known as the swoon theory of the resurrection. Now, some of you have actually had my Gospels class, I know, because some of you have audited classes here. I actually go through these in detail in my Gospels class, and they're kind of fun to, to think about. Let's talk about the first one for a second. What if someone said to you, what if, you, what if you're talking to your non-Christian friend and you said, hey, you know, the tomb was empty. There's no body there. He's not here. And they're like, oh, the disciples stole the body and just made up the resurrection. How would you reply to that? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, okay, exactly. So one, one thing that's odd is like, okay, so let's just say from all the disciples to the body, why would they undress him before, before, before they left? That's weird. Okay. It's a little strange. In other words, that doesn't make any sense. Why else? Why else would, why else would you push back against the disciples still in the body? Okay. We know from other gospels like Matthew's, actually there were guards around the tomb at a certain point before the stone was rolled back. Yep. <laughs> this is great. So you got a bunch of guys hiding in the upper room, not wanting any attention on themselves, right? Wanting to sort of get away and hide, and yet someone stands up and goes, guys, we, let's go steal the body. This is going to go really well for us, right? No one's doing that, okay? But the other thing that you have to realize about stealing the body, let's imagine they did steal the body. Here's some of the people that, who are the great, sat under the greatest moral teaching the world's ever seen, and suddenly they become liars. They steal the body. Just at, we're just going to become frauds overnight, steal the body, and make up the resurrection. But what happens when, when you start making up the resurrection and then the Romans start turning up heat on you, saying, you, you, you stop talking about the resurrection, stop, or we're going to put you to death, and you made it up, what would you do? You're not, you're not, you're not going to keep going, right? You're not going to die for something you know is a lie. People die for lies all the time, make no mistake about it, but they don't die for things they know are lies, and that's exactly what we have to believe the disciples did. So that doesn't work. How about the swoon theory? This is a very, this was, this was suggested by a, a German scholar by the name of, of, of Paulus who came up with the swoon theory. And the idea is, well, when Jesus swooned on the cross in the ancient world, people didn't have much medical training. They, they thought he was dead. He really wasn't. So they took him off the cross. He was really alive. And then later he kind of, you know, got his sort of energy back and came and appeared to his disciples. And they thought, oh, look, he rose from the dead. How would you, what, do you, what would you say in response to the swoon theory? Yep. Yes. The idea that you could survive this, the idea that you, Jesus was almost dead before they even started to crucify him. Um, so, so, so that's one thing. The other thing you'd have to believe is that, you know, the, that they say, well, you know, Roman guards thought he's dead. Yeah, you got, as if they're not very good at killing people, right? They don't know how to do this. This is what they do right? They know how to put people to death. But there's a bigger problem with the swoon theory. What happens when Jesus wakes up in the tomb and there's a stone in front of the thing? How's he rolling that back? He's like half dead. 
And then imagine a pair of your disciples, half dead. Does he look like a resurrected Lord? And what would Jesus say to his disciples? He would be like, why'd you guys bury me alive? What's your problem, right? The whole thing doesn't work um, in order to explain the idea of Jesus as a resurrected Messiah. So the empty tomb is a key piece of evidence. Let's talk about the angel for a moment. This is interesting. This is, I know, an odd way to describe it. Look at verse 5 again. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Now, Mark gives us the description as this person looked. Other Gospels tell us the identity of this person is clearly an angel. Okay? So young man is actually not that unusual as a way to describe angels. Angels actually look like humans at first glance oftentimes. They have a, a certain physical feature. They look like a human being. In fact, sometimes angels apparently throughout the Old Testament would appear and you didn't even yet know they were an angel in certain instances. So the fact that this person is described as a young man is not at all unusual, pretty common, dressed in white. It's clear that they were alarmed. Um, And this alarming here um, probably is evidence that, again, they recognize that this is not just some guy hanging out in a tomb. Like, why would he be there, right? Like, you have a tomb, like, oh, look, you're just hanging out in here to get out of the heat? No, this is clearly something supernatural going on. They're alarmed by this. And we have him give the testimony. An angel's testimony is therefore God's testimony, okay? Angels speak for God. Why would we believe in the resurrection? Well, one is because of the empty tomb. One is because we have a testimony of an angelic being. He is not here. Why? Because he has risen. You may not realize this, but it's actually the angel who rolled back the stone. We see this in the other Gospels more plainly. It's implied in Mark, but it's clear the angel rolled back the stone. And we usually think that the angel rolled back the stone so Jesus could get out. I don't think that's really what's going on here. Jesus' resurrected body had properties that are really hard to understand in terms of his ability to sort of be in different places. It's more likely to say this, as the angel didn't so much roll the stone so Jesus could get out, but so that the women could get in. Or another way to say it is the stone was rolled back as as come see, right? The place where he lay. It's a, it's a open look at the evidence. It's basically saying Jesus doesn't need, if, if Jesus is the risen son of God, he's not blocked in there. He could just move the stone himself just by a command. The stone was rolled back by the angel so that you could see the evidence of an empty tomb, so that you could see in to this place where Jesus lay. We don't have time in the other gospels to look at them, but the other Gospels, you remember, Peter and John raced to the tomb, and they ran in too at a different point, after the women. Remember, the women see it first, come back and report, and Mark doesn't tell us this part of the story, but Peter and John, we know when John's Gospel raced to the tomb and look in there, um, and they see the empty tomb, and we're told in that moment, John believed, because he saw the grave clothes light out, and no body, and he knew he had risen. So the angelic testimony should be seen in conjunction with the angelic act, Roll back the stone so we can go in and see where he lay. But flip your notes over. Here's the third thing that I want you to see about reasons to believe the resurrection is that Jesus made appearances. Jesus made appearances. We don't have the recording of it in Mark, but we have the telling us it will happen in Mark. Look at verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee, There you will see him, just as he told you. Here's what you recognize then is one of the major reasons that we believe in the resurrection, because people saw him alive. Disciples saw him alive. Countless other witnesses saw him alive. We have a a text in 1 Corinthians 15, which we don't have time to turn to, which is where Paul gives his own account of the resurrection there, where Jesus not only appeared to the 12, but appeared to 500 people at one time as the risen Lord. One of the major reasons we believe in the resurrection is because people saw him alive. Now, people try to explain this too. Well, you could come up with lots of different theories on this. One is that people are just lying, right? They say they saw Jesus when they really didn't. I suppose that that could explain a few, but how do you, how do you, how do you get 500 people to lie? How do you get, and beyond that, there's other resurrection appearances, And we also talked about why would the disciples lie when they sat under some of the greatest moral teaching the world had ever seen, 
and then suddenly just start lying? This doesn't pan out historically. Others have tried to explain the, 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 the eyewitness uh, accounts of Jesus as, as group hallucinations. And I always find this kind of funny, group hallucinations. By definition, hallucinations are not a group activity, right? Um, I mean, if you're wondering if you're hallucinating, what do you always say? You say to the person next to you, are you seeing what I'm seeing, right? That's how you know that you're not hallucinating. If he's seeing it too, then by definition, you're not hallucinating. You don't hallucinate in groups, Okay. <laughs> There is a, a real sense, and again, N.T. Wright covers this in his book. The resurrection appearances are a tremendous piece of the pie here for why we believe um, in the resurrected Lord. Now, there's more to say, right? If, if someone says, why do you believe Jesus is alive? You could say something legitimate like, because he's alive in my heart, right? That I trust him. I know he's a living Lord now. I, I prayed him. You know, I know he's alive. Okay, that's all legitimate. But historically speaking, we have even more than that, right? We have the empty tomb, we have the eyewitnesses' appearances, we have the angelic testimony, and we have the mere existence of the Christian movement that didn't end. All of that gives tremendous evidence to the resurrection. But that leads us to our third P. What are we going to do with that? We have the pessimism, we have the, the proof, and now the proclamation, right? The whole payoff here is go and tell. Look at what the angel says to the women again in verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. The women were not merely the first witnesses, which, by the way, as a side note, fits with the theme. We've and Notice how this keeps coming up in, in Mark. It's amazing how often... Women are playing a significant role in the ministry of Jesus. I've said it over and over again. Be encouraged by that. We've seen it after passage, after passage, after passage. They're the first ones that get to see him alive. If Jesus rose from the dead, it's the greatest event in the history of the world. There's no greater event in the history of the world than the resurrection of Jesus. Who sees him first? Would you not have been, wanted to have been the one to see him first? Would the disciples in retrospect not say, I wish I could have seen him first? Who gets to see him first? Who gets that privilege? The women. And when they do, they are told not just to simply be eyewitnesses, but to be missionaries, okay? You, you, you don't get to just see Jesus and enjoy him. There's a second step. You go tell people what you've seen. That's the step that I want to encourage us to ponder today. People need to hear the message of Jesus being alive. That's the whole point of the Gospel of Mark. As we come to the close of the Gospel of Mark, what's the whole point? He's alive, and we need to go tell people about who he is. Isn't it interesting that the angel is actually specific in this case? Who's the first pe people that need to be encouraged? The disciples. And then notice this interesting little addition here in verse 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Wait a second. Pause on that for a second. Isn't Peter one of the disciples? Isn't this therefore redundant? Notice the angel's like, and you know the angel's speaking for Jesus here, right? It's not just making up stuff. I'm giving you a message from Jesus. You'll see him in Galilee. And go tell the disciples, that they'll see Jesus. And by the way, don't forget to tell Peter, right? Peter, at this point, think about what he's going through. All the disciples are responding, but then you got Peter over there hanging his head, thinking, man, I just gave over my best friend, and he's dead. He's dead. Probably blaming himself, probably feeling weight for his cowardice, probably laboring under the weight of that guilt, and the hope of the resurrection is, go tell Peter it's going to be just fine. Go tell Peter it's going to be okay. Go tell Peter that I forgive him. Go tell Peter that there's hope. Okay, here's the, here's the whole message of the Gospel of Mark. Take the resurrection, and there's people that need that message today. Okay, There's people that, just like Peter needed it, there's people who are hurting and despondent and sorrowful and feel the weight of the guilt of their sin and the guilt of their life or whatever they're going through. Go and tell them Jesus has risen. Just like go, go tell Peter. He, I know he needs to hear this. Go tell him. There's people in your life right now that need to be told. So go tell them. That's the message of the whole Gospel of Mark. The women, we don't get to find out all that they do because our, our passage doesn't cover all that. But they go out, and we know from the other Gospels that they do go back to the 12. And the 12 eventually takes some convincing. They do believe. And Peter, guess what? When, when Peter finds out John tells us he ran to the tomb. 
Can you imagine the first time Peter saw Jesus alive? Think about all that's just all that's lifted, all the, the pain and weight that's lifted. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus resurrected from the dead. Okay, what a great way to end, not just our passage, but our entire series. So lots to discuss in our groups. Let's turn to that and begin to reflect on these things, and let me pray as we do that. Lord, we're grateful for uh, evidence, proof that Jesus is alive. We know it in our hearts, Lord, but we know it in history. We have every reason to, to see it as real. And Lord, we, we need to be encouraged, Lord, that you would say, go and tell each of these people they need to hear that message just like Peter did. We need that, and Lord, help us to be the kind of people that tell others that freely and boldly. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.